This video provides an overview of the major concepts covered in Chapter 19, Bank Management. The performance of any commercial bank depends on the management of the bank's assets, liabilities, and capital. Increased competition has made efficient management essential for survival. Chapter 19 includes seven learning objectives. First, to describe the underlying goals, strategy, and governance of banks. Second, to explain how banks manage liquidity. Third, to explain how banks manage interest rate risk. Fourth, to explain how banks manage credit risk. Fifth, to explain how banks manage market risk. Sixth, to explain integrated bank management. And finally, to discuss how banks manage risk in international operations. Let's begin by discussing bank goals, strategy, and governance. The underlying goal of the managerial policies of a bank is to maximize the wealth of the bank's shareholders. And to achieve this goal, bank managers should make decisions that maximize the price of the bank's stock. To ensure that managers serve shareholder interests, banks commonly implement compensation programs and provide bonuses to high-level managers whose actions satisfy the bank's goals. After the 2008 to 2009 credit crisis, when many U.S. banks failed and many of the largest banks needed a government bailout, there was a lot of criticism targeted at compensation plans that encouraged executives to take excessive risk. In 2010, Congress passed the Financial Reform or Dodd-Frank Act, which contained several provisions aimed at reducing managerial compensation. A bank's strategy involves the management of its liabilities or sources of funds and its assets or uses of funds. Managerial decisions around fund sourcing will affect its income statement performance by heavily influencing interest expenses. Asset structure-related decisions will strongly influence its interest revenue in the income statement. The bank's asset structure also affects its operating expenses. A bank must also manage the operating risk that results from its general business operations related to information, execution of transactions, damage relationships with clients, legal issues, and regulatory issues. To implement their strategy, banks commonly rely on the financial markets, as shown in this exhibit. They rely on the money markets to obtain funds, on the mortgage and bond markets to use some of their funds, and on the futures, options, and swaps markets to hedge their risk. A bank's board of directors oversees the operations of the bank and attempts to ensure that managers make decisions that are in the best interest of the shareholders. Important functions of bank directors include the following responsibilities. To determine the compensation system for bank's executives, to ensure proper disclosure of the bank's financial condition and performance to investors, to oversee growth strategies such as acquisitions, overseeing policies for changing the capital structure, including decisions to raise capital or to engage in stock repurchases, and assessing the bank's performance to ensure corrective action is taken if the performance is weak because of poor management. Board members who are also managers of the banks, called inside directors, may sometimes face a conflict of interest because their decisions as board members may affect their jobs as managers. Outside directors, those who aren't managers, are generally expected to be more effective at overseeing a bank. They don't face a conflict of interest in serving shareholders. In addition to the board of directors, publicly traded banks are subject to potential shareholder activism. In particular, investors holding a relatively large number of shares can attempt to influence the approach taken by the bank's managers. Shareholders may also pursue proxy contests if they want to change the composition of the board, and they can file lawsuits if they believe the board is not serving shareholder interests. The second key concept in the chapter relates to managing liquidity. Healthy banks tend to have easy access to liquidity. Banks' liquidity problems are typically preceded by other financial problems, such as major defaults on their loans. Banks can resolve liquidity problems with proper management of their liabilities or their assets. Banks have access to various forms of borrowing, such as a federal funds market. If a bank needs funds for just a few days, an increase in short-term liabilities from the federal funds market may be appropriate. However, if the bank needs funds over a longer period, it may consider implementing a policy geared towards increasing deposits or selling liquid assets. Because some assets are more marketable than others, the bank's asset composition can affect its degree of liquidity. Banks should maintain a level of liquid assets, such as money market securities, that will satisfy their liquidity needs but use their remaining assets to earn a higher return. When the secondary market for loans is relatively active, banks can attempt to satisfy their liquidity needs with a higher proportion of loans while striving for higher profitability. However, loans are not as liquid as money market securities. Banks may be unable to sell their loans when economic conditions weaken, because many other banks may be attempting to sell their own loans at the same time, and very few financial institutions will be willing to purchase loans under those conditions. The ability to securitize assets, such as automobile and mortgage loans, can enhance a bank's liquidity position. The process of securitization commonly involves the sale of assets by the bank to a trustee who issues securities that are collateralized by the assets. 
Commercial banks can obtain funds by packaging their commercial loans with those of other financial institutions as collateralized loan obligations or CLOs, and then selling securities that represent ownership of these loans. Now let's discuss managing interest rate risk. The performance of a bank is highly influenced by the interest payments earned on its assets relative to the interest paid on its liabilities or deposits. The difference between interest payments received and interest paid is measured by the net interest margin, also known as the spread, which is calculated as interest revenues less interest expenses divided by assets. Because the rate sensitivity of a bank's liabilities usually does not perfectly match that of the assets, the net interest margin changes over time. The amount and direction of change depend on whether bank assets are more or less rate sensitive than bank liabilities, the degree of rate sensitivity, and the direction of interest rate movements. During a period of rising interest rates, a bank's net interest margin will likely decrease if its liabilities are more rate sensitive than its assets, as illustrated in this exhibit. Under the opposite scenario in which market rates decrease over time, rates offered on new bank deposits, as well as those earned on new bank loans, will be affected by the decline in interest rates. The deposit rates will typically be more sensitive if their turnover is quicker, as illustrated in this exhibit. No single method of measuring interest rate risk is perfect, so commercial banks use a variety of methods to assess their exposure to interest rate movements. Banks can attempt to determine their interest rate risk by monitoring the gap over time, where the gap is the difference between a bank's rate-sensitive assets less its rate-sensitive liabilities. An alternative formula is the gap ratio, which is measured as the value of rate-sensitive assets divided by rate-sensitive liabilities. A gap of zero, or gap ratio of 1.0, indicates that rate-sensitive assets equal rate-sensitive liabilities, so the net interest margin should not be significantly influenced by interest rate fluctuations. A negative gap, or gap ratio of less than 1.0, indicates that the rate-sensitive liabilities exceed rate-sensitive assets. Banks with a negative gap are typically concerned about a potential increase in interest rates, which could reduce their net interest margin. Let's look at an example. Kansas City, or KC Bank, had interest revenues of $80 million last year and interest expenses of $35 million. Approximately $400 million of its $1 billion in assets are rate-sensitive, and $700 million of its liabilities are rate-sensitive. Kansas City Bank's net interest margin is 4.5%. KC Bank's GAF is negative $300 million, and its GAP ratio is 57.14%. Many banks classify interest-sensitive assets and liabilities into various categories based on the timing of interest rate adjustments. By considering the schedule, the bank can determine the gap in each category and more accurately assesses exposure to interest rate risk. For example, Deakin Bank compares the interest rate sensitivity of its assets versus its liabilities as shown in this exhibit. It has a negative gap in a less than one-month maturity range, in the three- to six-month range, and in the six- to twelve-month range. Hence, the bank may hedge this gap if it believes that interest rates are An alternative approach to assessing the interest rate risk is to measure duration. Some assets or liabilities are more rate sensitive than others, even if the frequency of adjustment and the maturity are the same. The duration measurement can capture these different degrees of sensitivity. The duration of each type of bank liability can also be estimated, and the duration of the liability portfolio is likewise estimated as the weighted average of the durations of the liabilities. The bank can then estimate its duration gap, which is commonly measured as the difference between the weighted duration of the bank's assets and weighted duration of its liabilities, adjusted for the firm's asset size, where D-U-R-A-S is the weighted average duration of the bank's assets, D-U-R-L-I-A-B is the weighted average duration of the bank's liabilities, and A-S and L-I-A-B represent the market values of the bank's assets and liabilities respectively. Gap analysis and duration analysis are based on the bank's balance sheet composition. Alternatively, a bank can assess interest rate risk by determining the sensitivity of its performance to interest rate movements over time. Common proxies for performance include return on assets, return on equity, and the percentage change in stock price. To determine how performance is affected by interest rates, regression analysis can be applied to historical data. For example, using an interest rate proxy called I, the S&P 500 stock index is the market proxy, and the bank's stock return R as the performance proxy, the following regression model could be used where RM is the return on the market, B0, B1, and B2 are regression coefficients, and mu is an error term. The regression coefficient B2 in this model can also be called the interest rate coefficient because it measures the sensitivity of the bank's performance to interest rate movements 
A bank can consider the measurement of its interest rate risk along with its forecast of interest rate movements to determine whether it should consider hedging that risk. The general conclusions resulting from a bank's analysis of its interest rate risk are presented in this exhibit, which shows three methods commonly used by banks to measure their interest rate risk. Because none of these measures is perfect for all situations, some banks measure interest rate risk using all three methods. Interest rate risk can be reduced by a number of methods. One obvious method of reducing interest rate risk is to match each deposit's maturity with an asset of the same maturity. An alternative solution is to use floating rate loans, which allow banks to support long-term assets with short-term deposits without overly exposing themselves to interest rate risk. Large banks frequently use interest rate futures and other types of derivative instruments to hedge interest rate risk. One common method of reducing interest rate risk is to use interest rates futures contracts. This exhibit illustrates how the use of financial futures contracts can reduce uncertainty about a bank's net interest margin. The sale of interest rate futures, for example, reduces the potential adverse effect of rising interest rates on the bank's interest expenses, yet also diminishes the potential favorable effect of declining interest rates on the bank's interest expenses. Assuming that the bank initially had more rate-sensitive liabilities, its use of futures would reduce the impact of interest rates on its net interest margin. Commercial banks can hedge interest rate risk by engaging in interest rate swaps, which is an arrangement to exchange periodic cash flows based on specified interest rates. An alternative method of hedging interest rate risk is an interest rate cap, an agreement for a fee to receive payments when the interest rate of a particular security or index rises above a specified level during a specified time period. When a bank has foreign currency balances, the strategy of matching the overall interest rate sensitivity of assets to that of liabilities will not automatically achieve a low degree of interest rate risk. Even though a bank matches the mix of currencies in its assets and liabilities, it can still be exposed to interest rate risk if the rate sensitivities differ between assets and liabilities for each currency. The fourth learning objective relates to managing credit risk. Most of a bank's funds are either used to make loans or to purchase debt securities. In both cases, the bank acts as a creditor and is subject to credit or default risk, or the possibility that credit provided by the bank will not be repaid. An important step in managing credit risk is to assess the credit worthiness of the prospective borrowers before extending credit. This is commonly accomplished by determining the collateral required by a borrower and determining the appropriate loan interest rate to charge on loans. The extent of exposure to credit risk for a bank's loan portfolio depends on the type of loans that it provides and the exposure over time to changes in economic conditions. If a bank wants to minimize credit risk, it can use most of its funds to purchase treasury securities which are virtually free of credit risk. However, these securities may not generate a much higher yield than the average overall cost of obtaining funds. Thus, a bank's decision to create a very safe versus moderate or high-risk asset portfolio is a function of its risk return preferences. Many commercial banks aggressively funded subprime mortgages in the 2004 to 2006 period by originating these mortgages or by purchasing mortgage-backed securities that represented subprime mortgages. The banks pursuing this strategy expected that they were to earn a relatively high interest rate compared to that available on prime mortgages. They also assumed that subprime mortgages would have a low default risk because the homes served as collateral. These risky strategies contributed to the crash in the housing market and the credit crisis in the 2008 to 2009 period. Although all consumer and commercial loans exhibit some credit risk, banks can use several methods to reduce this risk, including industry diversification of loans, international diversification of loans, selling loans, and revising the loan portfolio in response to economic conditions. Now let's look at managing market risk. Banks commonly measure their exposure to market risk by applying the VAR method, which involves determining the largest possible loss that would occur as a result of changes in market prices based on a specified percentage confidence level. By determining its exposure to market risk, the bank can ensure that it has sufficient capital as a cushion against the adverse effects of such an event. Banks continually revise their estimate of the market risk in response to changes in their investment in credit positions and changes in market conditions. When market prices become more volatile, banks recognize that those prices could change to a greater degree. In turn, they typically increase their estimate of their potential losses due to market conditions. A bank's market risk partly depends on its exposure to interest rate risk because it's often the most important component of market risk. If a bank determines that its exposure to market risk is excessive, it can reduce its involvement in the activities that cause the high exposure. 
For example, the bank could reduce the amount of transactions in which it serves as a guarantor for its clients or reduce its investment in foreign debt securities that are subject to adverse events in a specific region. Alternatively, it could attempt to take some trading positions to offset some of its exposure to market risk. It could also sell some of its securities that are heavily exposed to market risk. The sixth key concept in the chapter relates to integrated bank management. Banks' management of assets, liabilities, and capital is integrated. The integration of asset, liability, and capital management ensures that all policies remain consistent with a cohesive set of economic forecasts. Therefore, an integrated management approach is necessary to manage liquidity risk, interest rate risk, and credit risk. Let's look at a comprehensive example. Assume that you're hired as a consultant by Atlanta Bank to evaluate its favorable and unfavorable aspects. Atlanta Bank's balance sheet is shown in this exhibit, from which we can identify key rate-sensitive assets, including floating rate loans, mortgages and short-term treasury securities, and liabilities, including now accounts, MMDAs, and short-term CDs, which we can summarize in this exhibit. Now, this allows us to determine the bank's gap, which is negative 200 million, and the gap ratio of 0.957, or 95.7%. We can also modify the balance sheet to express all line items as a percentage of total assets for easy comparison to the industry. Here we can identify how Atlanta's rate-sensitive assets and liabilities differ from industry averages. Pause the video and take note of the items that differ substantially from industry averages in this example. This exhibit summarizes the evaluation of Atlanta Bank against the industry. You should pause the video and carefully review the main influential components and Atlanta's performance relative to the industry. An evaluation of Atlanta Bank should also include an assessment of its capital. As is true for all banks, the future performance of Atlanta is influenced by the amount of capital that it holds. It needs to maintain at least the minimum capital ratio required by regulators. However, if Atlanta Bank maintains too much capital, each shareholder will receive a smaller proportion of any distributed earnings. A common measure of the return to shareholders is return on equity, or ROE, calculated simply as net income divided by equity, where equity represents the bank's capital. ROE can also be broken down into its constituent components of return on assets, or ROA, and leverage measure. ROA can be calculated as net income divided by assets, and leverage as assets divided by equity. The greater the leverage measure, the greater the amount of assets that are available per dollar's worth of equity. The last learning objective in the chapter relates to managing risk of international operations. Banks that are engaged in international banking face additional types of risk including exchange rate risk and settlement risk. When a bank providing a loan requires that the borrower repay in the currency denominating the loan, it may be able to avoid exchange rate risk. In many cases, banks convert available funds from recent deposits to whatever currency corporations want to borrow. In this way, they create an asset denominated in that currency whereas the liability or deposits is denominated in a different currency. If the liability currency appreciates against the asset currency, then the bank's profit margin is reduced. Thus, all large banks are exposed to exchange rate risk to some degree, though they can attempt to hedge the risk in various ways. International banks that engage in large currency transactions are exposed not only to exchange rate risk as a result of their different currency positions, but also to settlement risk or the risk of loss due to settling their transactions. For example, a bank may send its currency to another bank as part of a transaction agreement, yet it may not receive any currency from the other bank if it defaults before sending its payment.